the most dangerous enemy of individual rights, freedom based upon individual rights, is America. How did this come about? Well, it came about because America became an empire. We are joined once again by Salim Mansur, Professor Emeritus at Western University. Good day, Salim. Good morning. Uh, good day, Robert. And good Happy day. New Year, by the way. This is our first conversation in 2024. Yes, yes, it is. Happy New Year. Um, today, we're going to usher in this new year by reflecting on recent political events and discussing what we might expect for 2024. But first, I'd like to uh, preface our discussion with a few words. As a young man, I grew up in Canada in the 60s and the 70s. I idolized the United States of America and more particularly its origins and the ideas for which it stood. Today, however, while I still revere the philosophic underpinnings of that great nation and admire its people, I despise what has become of that republic. In any objective sense, it could be called a rogue state impoverishing its own people, engaging in a perpetual war against foreign nations and foreign peoples. It is obviously fundamentally flawed to get to this state. Its current president is a usurper, and the vast majority of congressmen are corrupt, in office solely for their own personal fortunes and glory. In my estimation, the beginning of the end of that uh, once great republic may be traced back to at least 1898, and the sinking of the USS Maine, and the reporting of that incident by the yellow press of Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Now, we're not going to get into detail here about that, but I would urge you to look up that incident and how it was reported on and what Congress did because of the yellow journalism of the Pulitzer and Hearst papers. The unscrupulous and corrupt fourth estate led to America's downfall. And this trend of decay continues today where the yellow press is now called the mainstream media. The government is now a cabal of power elites and the people are mere serfs in their own nation, a chattering mob to these ruling elites. Recently, however, there's been a shift in power and information control, most importantly. With the advent of social media and independent journalism, the people are becoming more informed about the true nature of those we have come to now refer to as the deep state or the globalists or the ruling oligarchs. As a result, there is a resistance forming. It's still in its infancy, but growing as a network and as a force. So there's hope, therefore, that there will be a transition, hopefully peaceful, from rule by the elites to rule by, once again, we the people. Salim, what do you make of my assessment of the globalist juggernaut and our prospects for defeating it? I think your assessment is right on the mark, on the target. I mean, that's been, or that is, uh, the concern of anyone who takes a broad view uh, of history uh, um, and current affairs and asks the question, how have we arrived here? And then, I mean, as again, part of your opening remark, how have we arrived here and what are we to expect in the coming year and going forward? I mean, you've called America a rogue state, and I agree, it is a rogue state. But it was the man who was running for the highest office, elected office in America in the 2016 election, uh, a businessman, um, not from within the political class or the ruling class in Washington or having anything in touch with Washington uh, was Donald Trump. And it was Donald Trump who coined the term that if he is elected president, he will drain the swamp. So swamp or the rogue state amounts to the same thing. And so the question that we are asking that you have posed in your opening remarks is how has America fallen and fallen so deep and so bad? How is a Republican constitutional democracy as it was founded in 1776 is now not only a shadow of what it was supposed to be, but it is completely contrary 
to what the founding fathers has established. You know, and we all know the famous saying of Benjamin Franklin when he was asked uh, in Philadelphia by one of the citizens coming out of their uh, meetings, uh, what have you made, sir? And his famous reply, we have made a republic if you can keep it. And the Americans have not only failed to keep it as a people, but the Americans who were given the responsibility by the people and they take the oath of office to protect the Constitution have basically not only abandoned their oath of office, but have gone ahead to emasculate and destroy that oath of office. So how have you arrived here? That is the leading question. Before, and, and then, you know, giving the evidence of where we are and how do we go forward. That's what we are confronted with. You are absolutely, again, right um, in, in dating the beginning to going back to the Spanish-American War in Cuba, the sinking of U.S. as Maine, the pretext which launched the war. But what was that war about and what did that war become? Uh, is, I think, the disclosure, the exposure of the falling down of America, of the derailment of America as a republic. There had been many other challenges. I mean, of course, you know, 1898 is the date that you have selected to point out the beginning of this process of derailment or falling down came only uh, 38 years after the guns were fired with the Civil War. We can go back to the Civil War or we can go forward because we have to find the two ends of the bracket, whether it's 1898 or something else that can be pointed out. And I will make my observation on that in a moment. And the closing of the bracket. I would say <clears throat> that the opening of the bracket or the two ends of the bracket is the election of President Woodrow Wilson in 1912. And the end of the bracket where America has completely fallen is the installation rather than the election of uh, Joe Biden as a 46th president. So between the two Democrats, and both of them coming from border states of the Civil War, um, Woodrow Wilson was from the border state, of, I believe Maryland, from where he had moved on to New Jersey, where he became the uh, president of the Ivy League school, uh, Princeton University, on his run for the presidency. And Joe Biden is from the uh, borderland state, that Mason-Dixie line, that is Maryland, you know. And so here you have, and both of them, both of them are Democrats. Uh, but now we have effectively what we call in Washington, as you you pointed out, that the elected members are all corrupt, or most of them are corrupt. Uh, so it is a uniparty system. It's only by name that there are two parties two choices, Democrats and Republicans, but effectively the swamp is run by a uniparty. It's a combination of both. You know, they're both complicit in all of this. So <clears throat> the two brackets are then, I would say, which of course does not in any way um, take away the point of the Cuban War, the Spanish-American War. Uh, but with uh, Woodrow Wilson, the 1912 election, number of things begins to happen whose results have now reached the point where we have reached. You know, so let let me quickly make a few points on that matter. What began with Woodrow Wilson uh, and the unraveling of the American Constitution and and, and <clears throat> the making of. Um, the post-constitutional America, which is what it is in effect today it is. It is a post-constitutional America that we are living in. In this period, um, roughly uh, 110 years, so let's take a century, 
um, the unraveling of the America that you fell in love with as you came of age, as you pointed out, the 60s and the 70s. Um, and in my case, you know, um, I began my 51st year in Canada. I arrived, um, you know, exactly 50 years ago or a little over 50 years ago and went to United States. And from United States, I came to Canada. And so in these 50 years, I have seen uh, that unraveling that I too, like you, um, fell in love with what America represented. And I don't think we were alone. You and I, we were alone. Um, this was pretty much a global phenomena. Uh, <clears throat> there was a left-right uh, binary opposition of difference in the world at that time. I'm referring to the Cold War, communism, and free societies, capitalism, open society, democracy, however, these would be defined and later on corrupted. Mm -hmm. There was two, two systems, basically, in opposition to each other. And America represented um, <clears throat> the, um, the finest uh, exposition uh, or example or icon of a free and open society based upon a Republican constitution. And so we are asking you and I, and I think people around the world, people who have followed America, who have looked up to America, leaders around the world. Uh, Putin, for instance, um, in his New Year um, press conference spoke for something like four hours to the press assembly in Moscow. Uh, Putin, what I understand from his biography and having followed him for the, the last couple of years, um, is a man who is willing to go to the press, to the fourth estate, and engage with the press, not in sound bites, but in long conversation, four hours without a note. Um, can you imagine Joe Biden doing that? He wouldn't be able to do that for four minutes before he has to take recourse to a teleprompter uh, and get his diaper uh, cleaned out. So, um, what what I read about uh, uh, Putin's uh, interview uh, over the New Year uh, or or conversation with the press was one of it was his uh, Putin was reflecting, asking himself, asking the people around him, what has happened to America, and I think this is a question that is being asked by just about every leader or most leaders whether they are defined by the American press and the American politician as the axis of evil, as they did that during the Iraq war, you know, or, or that, that they are permanent enemies. Why they are permanent enemies, that too is an open question, but say the leader of North Korea or the leader of Vietnam or, or the leader of Brazil, I'm just randomly choosing these countries because they are from the global south. They're all asking what has happened to America? And they are searching for answers because they're looking at it from the outside. It is you and I and people like us who are asking the same question, but we're asking it from within. You know, yes. Salim, as well, we're picking on the United States and quite rightly, but the same argument or discussion could be had about Britain Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, Western Europe, all of those nations who, when you say, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, before the, well, early 90s, before the wall fell in Berlin, it was cut and dried. There was good and evil. There was the access of evil. There was the uh, coalition of the willing. There was the free people, the civilized world. That civilized world, we can no longer call a civilized world, at least I, in my opinion because it is not civilized. And so when we ask the questions about what happened to the United States, 
we can also fill in the blank and also ask the questions about Britain and Canada as well and all those other Anglosphere nations and Western nations that were once free. Yes, absolutely. Um, talking about the United States it is also talking about what we might, uh, and it is regularly pointed out, the collective West, that is the G7 countries, the advanced democracy, so to speak, you know, or what was the allied powers uh, and their satellites at the end of World War II in 1945. So we are talking about again Western Europe because, in 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 the phrase of uh, Winston Churchill, the Iron Curtain had come down from the Baltics to the Trias, and the Iron Cur Curtain, in that sense, divided the world into two halves, politically speaking, in terms of ideology, ideology, um, and and that two world was you know East and West. East was Soviet Union and its satellites, you know, in Eastern Europe. And then um, those countries that the Soviet Union was targeting to make it their satellite, Soviet Union satellite, um, <clears throat> whether it was Korea, whether it was Vietnam, you know, uh, Middle East, Africa. And um, west of the Iron Curtain was Western Europe. Uh, and North America, which became NATO, later on became the G7 countries. So the leadership on the West was with the United States, and that's what we are focusing on. Um, a fish rots from its head, and, 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 and that's what was happening. The fish that began to rot from the head, in the case of the West, is the United States and 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 the ailment, the malady spreads right down the head to all the satellites and all the features that make up that one collective vest. Similarly, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the fish rots from the head, and that was the Soviet Union. But we don't have the Soviet Union. The rottenness of the Soviet Union eventually imploded. And Soviet Union got dismantled, dismantled by its own people. Are we headed in the same direction as what happened to the Soviet Union? Because, you know, we were a binary world for almost all of 20th century. And uh, the Soviet Union imploded and was dismantled. The collapse of the Soviet Union took place beginning with the bringing down of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and um, <clears throat> the Soviet Union itself uh, ended um, in December of 1991, and it broke apart. It collapsed into its constituent republics, which all became, in a sense, uh, sovereign states, um, the largest being the Russian Federation. So are we talking about, in that sense, analogous event we are headed into in the case of the collective West that is with the United States. Is the United States imploding? My sense is, and I think you share, given your opening remark, that some sort of implosion is in the process and we are witnessing it. The talk of a civil war, the difference between the red states and the blue state, the manner in which uh, we have seen over the last um, seven, eight years, that is the, almost a decade now, beginning with the primary season in American politics, that is the presidential election in 2015, when Donald Trump announced his candidacy. And then eventually, against all the odds, uh, became the president. Um, and there was no time wasted, even before um, the ink had dried on the announcement on the night of election in November 8th, I think it was, um, of 2016, that Donald Trump had won uh, the presidency. The Electoral College numbers indicated that he would be the next president. Uh, so even before his inaugural, the full attempt began to... Um, 
undermine his presidency and to destroy him, the whole fabricated um, Russia hoax that the election had been hijacked by Russia for Donald Trump, which we now know all of that was a lie. So this, this internal conflict within uh, or between um, the ruling elite, the ruling class in America, and the people, at the end of the day, the president is elected by the people. It's the only elected office where all the American people come together and vote. And the system is unique that that voting then is translated through the electoral college to who is eventually the president. Um, so Ron, Donald Trump was coming from the outside, outside of the DC ruling class. And the DC ruling class that President Trump now pointed out in the campaign that it is the swamp and he's going to drain it. So the swamp or the rogue state, in your definition, um, went full speed, accelerated the process of turning down the will of the people who had elected the, Donald Trump as president. And we saw, and we can go into the detail, that the entire four years until the election of 2020 was stolen and Biden was installed, was a war between the government or the rogue state or the swamp or the military industrial complex and the oligarchs. All of these are relevant definition of what America had become against the people. Because the attack on Donald Trump was an attack on the people, that they did not, the ruling class did not accept the result of what had happened in the 2016 election. And we can see that right through these past eight years, the accelerated process, and that is what strikes us, if it had been gradual and incremental, like the proverbial statement that a frog in water, slowly you increase the heat, doesn't feel it till it is boiled. It doesn't flee, it doesn't jump out. But if you ratchet up to boiling temperature immediately, the frog will jump out, but he doesn't. So the incremental process of the destruction of the Republican America had come into force, as you point out, with this, the Spanish-American War in 1898, and I'm just taking it further down, from 1898 to the 1912 election of Woodrow Wilson, the process had begun. And the acceleration took place with Donald Trump because the ruling class saw that if Donald Trump succeeds and he comes back for a second term, then the entire project of the ruling class will unravel. Uh, right now, we've outlined some events and bracketed the destruction of the United States with a couple of events. And and I would agree that on this side of the bracket, it would be the installation of Joe Biden. Um, if we were to ask the question, what was it that happened? Without referring necessarily to an event, it would be ideas and information. And that's why I, I talked about yellow journalism and the Spanish-American War, because it was the lies of the press at the time that convinced Congress to go to war uh, and the misinformation um, of the yellow journalists. And today we see the same thing. And throughout history, we have, you and I have recently had an epiphany over the last few years about exactly what is happening, especially when we see uh, the election of 2020 and the obvious fraud that went on there. We now go back in history, you being a historian, especially, go back in history and revisit all of these events to find out, well, look at this. You could say that all of the tragedies, or the vast majority of the tragedies that have happened throughout the world, have <laughs> happened as a result of the deep state and the bolstering of the deep state by the press. The fourth estate, to me, 
is one of the main reasons that we are where we are today. Information is the key. We see that now with social media and people being able to find out for themselves the facts and the truth. And everybody has a camera so we can see the videos for ourselves unedited through the lens of the yellow journalists and the mainstream media. Also, on top of that, you may want to talk about this yourself because you, having worked at a university, um, have an insight to it that might be uh, germane. And that is that the educational institutions, right from kindergarten to university, have all been co-opted, have all been corrupted, have all been infected with ideas that are antithetical to reality and reason and good governance. And not only just those institutions, but the publishers who publish the books that are used as textbooks in classes, in classrooms and in universities. When you when you boil it down, it, it comes down into the hands of, of just a few people. And by a few, I mean in, in the hundreds, or if not the thousand, which is just, you know, an extremely small percentage of our population are in control of the information that the people get. Publishers, there's now just a couple of publishers in this country. News organizations, they're on the hands of a couple of people. All of the news, we Bell Media controls so much. You know, the Rogers uh, controls so much. Uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink, nine and a half trillion dollar, dollars under his command. He can dictate the terms of all of the businesses that he effectively owns or controls, if not outright owns. So we have a handful of people. They're not the high cabal. They're a lower level of the cabal, but still, they're the elites controlling information. What do you think, especially as a university professor? What I say is, you know, the, the, the thesis... Uh, is America has fallen down, which with which we began, with which you began, um, and a elite, a ruling elite, a ruling class, has basically subverted and in effect destroyed the Republican Constitution. How did that happen? Is therefore the need to explain and everything that you have said comes into um, this notion that Republican democracy operates within the guardrails of we the people. We the people provide the guardrails. The constitution begins with we the people. By the way, we're focused on America because very rightly, as you said, America represents or did represent until the 19 mid, mid 20th century, you know, when you, you were personalizing your observation, 1960s and 70s, you know, America was the ideal, as if I if I understood you rightly. And I agree with that. And I, I, I want to read something that uh, if you permit me. But the point is that we the people are the guardrails. We, the people, elect the representative. The Constitution is our document, that is, we, the people's document. And the guardrails of we, the people, is represented through an open press, the fourth estate, that is guaranteed by the First Amendment right. Uh, that is free speech. Um, the guardrail is the churches or the religious institution that reflects and holds to a moral foundation of the society of the we the people america is a, uh, is and was uh, in its founding a christian nation and um the the founding fathers were all in that sense christians whether they called themselves deists um as as Jefferson did, or they were, you know, devoted members of their own denominational churches is besides the point. It is it was a Christian nation 
that in its constitution established as um, worked out in the First Ten Amendment, that there would be no established church. So this establishment of the church, the complete separation of church and state that is guaranteed by the First Amendment, right? And the fact that it is there is no established church, the disestablishment of church, that is no one central church institution is going to be this state church, as say in Britain, the Anglican church is the state church, you know, or the Roman Catholic church. So people are free to practice their religion, uh, free to practice, you know, what they believe in. Nobody's going to stop them. Nobody is going to que question them. So if you if you are not a Christian, you're still free to practice, you know, as an American, whatever is your belief system or non-belief system. So the guardrail is there. That's the, the, the religious institution. And the non-religious people have their own institution, you know, whatever it may be. The Masonic Lodge or, you know, their clubs and service clubs and so on and so forth. But there is a consensual agreement on the working of the Constitution and they are the checks and balances. And then comes the education institution right from, you know, the uh, secondary and elementary school to the highest uh, uh, universities, many of the universities in the New England states were initially church colleges that eventually became like Harvard, like Princeton, like Yale. They began as denominational colleges of the various Christian denomination, Protestant denomination, and eventually they became, you know, universities, you know. Um, <clears throat> but But they were independent, and it was guaranteed that there will be no interference into what the university are engaged in doing. Basically, research, writing, exploring, questioning, critiquing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the guardrails of um, any society. But in the case of America as a republican democracy, these were the guardrails to protect the Constitution. But then one by one, it is not simply the fall of America. The fall of America comes around because the guardrails of the Constitution become corrupted. And as the guardrails become corrupted and starts falling apart, which we can explore, the ultimate, which is the constitutional arrangement of America, begins to fall down, you know. The 20, 1912, uh, 1912 election, and as a bracket, a century bracket, Woodrow Wilson and then Joe Biden, there were a number of things that took place. Now we can look back and see what the consequences were. And I would say two developments took place immediately with uh, the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson in 1913. In those days, inauguration took place in the month of March. Election took place in November. Inauguration took place in March. Immediately after the inauguration in March, there were two amendments that took place in uh, were brought about. Uh, one was the amendment that brought about the income tax which, in a sense, changed the relationship between the federal government and the uh, states. America is a federation. Each state has its own constitution. Um, well, income tax changed that relationship because it gave power to the federal government to reach across the state lines into the pocket of every individual, you know. You you were an American, but you were equally an Alabaman. You were equally a Texan or a Michigan, uh, and so on and so forth, because each state had its own, you know, constitution, and it was represented in the in Washington, um, in the federal state at the center by their representatives. So there is a huge. A change that takes place with uh, the income tax coming in. Now, this federal government can make war without depending upon the state. 
The second was the amendment, and I think it was the 17th amendment that was parallel to the, the 16th amendment, which brought about income tax. The 17th amendment changed the nature of the election of senators. In the constitution of what was passed in 1789, Article 1 of the Constitution, the three major articles, Article 1 deals with the legislature, the Congress. Article 2 deals with the power of the executive, the president. And Article 3 deals with the judiciary. Three branches of the government equal three branches, checks and balances built into the Constitution. So in Article 1, let me read it to you. Article 1, Section 3, this is the original before the amendment. It states, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. So until 1913, the 17th Amendment, the senators were appointed by the state. Why um, was this arrangement um, conceived and implemented? Was that the House of Representatives is the people's house. It is based upon population, and the people elect the representative which is where it should be. And it is the people who are responsible on the question of taxation, revenue, and so on and so forth, and also on the question of war and peace. It is the House of Representatives, the Congress, that declares the war. President Franklin Roosevelt, on December the 8th morning, after December 7, 1941, went to the Congress, to the House, to ask the House to declare war on Japan. Right? So um, the House of Representatives is the people's house. The speaker is the people's person. Um, the Senate is the house of the Federation of the states. And each state sending two senators is where comes the question of equality. You might be a small state like New Jersey, but you have two senators. And you might be a big state like Texas or California, you still have two, two senators. So all the states are equal in the process of legislating in the House, in the Congress. The 13th Amendment changed that. I'm sorry, the 17th Amendment changed that. The 17th Amendment brought about the following. And this is a reading from the 17th Amendment, April 8, 1913. That is within weeks of the election of, uh, or, or so rather, the inauguration of uh, Woodrow Wilson. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. In other words, instead of the states appointing the senators, and therefore, the senators being responsible to the state and can be recalled by the state back home if those two senators vote against the interests of the state. And who protects the interests of the state? The state legislature, the state governor, and the state legislature. That is the constitution. But with the election of the senators, the state loses control of the senators. What is the difference then between the senators who are elected by the people of the state and the members of the Congress, the House of Representatives who are elected by the state? Mm -hmm. So both then become open to eventually corruption by the manipulation of the people and the money that is sent to these individuals to get elected. And that's what we have. It's almost the, as if they lost one of their checks and balances. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this this has been part of the struggle but, uh, in, in among the people to return back to the state. You know, when they say the state right, 
You know, what is the responsibility of the state? The state is supposed to run every aspect of the people's interests within the state and within the federation. The constitution can only, that is, what is enumerated. The federal government can only legislate, tax, or act upon what is enumerated in the constitution. Anything that is not enumerated in the constitution is in the domain of the state, in the realm of the state. All right. But with this 17th Amendment, which was not immediately noticeable, it was passed, it was propagandized, and it was sold on the notion of democracy. But America is not simply a democracy. America is a republican system of government within the Constitution. But now the people say, this is democratic. We are going to elect our senators. Well, lo and behold, you did elect your senator. The consequences of that has played out over the 100 years. That is, once elected, the senators and the congressmen no longer end up representing the people. They end up representing those who elect them, that is the money class. And that which was not discernible, noticeable at the beginning has now become a chasm as wide as an ocean. The people in Washington, they say whatever they want to say during the election time, but they come to Washington and they are captives of the donor class. Whether the donor class are the oligarchs who are financing the Republican Party, the Koch brothers, for instance, you know, uh, or they are financing the Democratic Party, the Israeli lobby, or you know, the hedge fund donors, uh, the Bill Gates, the George Soroses, the Jeff Bezos. It doesn't matter. The people have been the 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 link between the people and the representative has been cut. And this has been the beginning of the eventual fall of America. So what you see, again, going back, I mean, we're trying to connect the dot. There are lots of dots to connect. We won't have the time, but I can make a large remark and, and we can connect the dot or people can connect the dot by themselves, doing the, doing a, a sort of a, a look into history. From, from the election of Donald, uh, Woodrow Wilson to the election of Joe Biden, this over a hundred plus years, the American people have been lied to consistently on all the major issues of the time. The founding fathers had made a republic Woodrow Wilson and the people who followed him turned the Republic into an empire that began with the Spanish-American War, you know, uh, the sinking of the USS Maine and so on and so forth. But America became involved beyond its borders, beyond its hemisphere, into the affairs of other countries. It went down looking for monsters to destroy, in the words of John Quincy Adam, that America was not made to go out to destroy monsters. It was to protect its own freedom and democracy, right? President uh, Washington, the founding father, the, the, the first president in his farewell address said, you know, do not get entangled with the politics of the old world. At that time, the old world and new world was America and Europe. You're not getting entangled with the... Don't make alliances with any country. Don't choose and make any one country your special, you know, ally. All of these warnings were slowly, incrementally stripped, beginning with the Woodrow Wilson presidency, you know. Would you think that um, the... The reason that the United States did not join the League of Nations after World War I, I thought was part of um, that sentiment that they do not, they do not um, share power with foreigners, foreign potentates, foreign leaders. 
they will not be subjected to the vote or the whim of other nations. So they did not join the League of Nations. That was my understanding of perhaps why. <clears throat> and yet, of course, post, post-World War II, 1945, you have the United Nations now. And they, they join. Matter of fact, they host it. So do you think that that's perhaps another um, indication of the fall of the Republic? as a sovereign nation wanting to protect its own interests, you know, and not get involved in the uh, affairs of foreign states when they joined the United Nations, whereas before they did not join the League of Nations? Yes and no. I mean, uh, what what you have raised, the question, need to be again explored within the context. Uh, League of Nations and not joining the League of Nations, that is... Um, the Senate uh, refusing to vote. The Senate has to pass the treaty of any any sort that the president brings, um, and so um, the League of Nation. The League of Nation was being set up after World War One um, in 1919. Uh, treat, the Treaty of Paris uh, or Versailles. Uh, part of it was about setting up the League of Nation. Uh, and it would have been a uh, basically it's a European effort uh, if you go back to that time period and look at it. Europe was still the power center. America was the outsider coming in. Uh, the Republican senators in uh, Washington opposed um, Woodrow Wilson for a number of reasons, but the primary reason, uh, in my view, was that the president had lied. To Americans and taken America into a war, which had cost over a hundred and thirty thousand lives, and you know, destruction, money, and so on and so forth. He had lied. He got elected in nineteen twelve because the Republican Party got divided uh, between uh, Warren Harding and um, um, Theodore Roosevelt who had served two terms but wanted to come back. And he split the party with his Bull Moose party, and that basically gave um, the Democrats, who had not elected a president uh, since the Civil War, the opportunity to elect Wilson as the president. So uh, Wilson got elected with less than 50% of the popular vote. And then he ran in... 1916, well, the war in Europe was ablaze. And um, he ran on the slogan and on the promise that America will not go to war. He's, he will not take America to war. And then immediately after election and his inauguration in April, he announced America is going to war. That was the Lusitania incident that was used. So there you have it, the pretext of Lusitania, uh, which was... It's just like the Gulf of Tonkin, Gulf of Tonkin Maine. in Vietnam. You know, there's all these pretexts of war, the invasion of Pearl Harbor when they knew that they were going to be invaded because they had right. broken so, codes. Right. So the, the, the point you were, you had raised with the League of Nations, yeah. so there it was. I mean, you know, they, they'd taken America into war, and there was the Republicans... Um, when when Woodrow Wilson came back, were not willing to fund and be involved with Europe, you know. So they they said no, and so there we have what became subsequently. Subsequently, as the 1930s and 40s came around, the argument became that what is happening in Europe is happening because America went into isolation. America went into isolation, one can argue, was going back to America first politics of George Washington and the founding fathers. Because from 1776 and the end of that war, uh, um, the Paris Treaty of 1783 and then America coming together under a constitution that was passed in 1789, America was not engaged. I mean, Europe had been in war, the Napoleonic Wars and the wars that went on, dynastic wars uh, through the 19th century. America did not participate. Americans did not go out there. Uh, 
America had its own problems and America dealt with its own problem, rightly or wrongly. The largest problem, the biggest problem came with the civil war. So going into Europe and becoming involved in the European war was against the very warnings that had been set forward by not only the founding fathers, but carried through in the subsequent administrations, you know, that we do not get involved with the old world. We don't get involved with empire making and empire building. But it all began, yes, in 1898 with, this, with the Spanish empire beginning to fall apart and America intervened. It was not only Cuba, it was Philippines and so on and so forth. And America started becoming an empire. And what is the disease of an empire? The disease of an empire is empire nullifies and negates freedom at home, just as it engages in coercing people abroad. The, an empire is coercion. It's running the lives of other people. It's imposition. It's conquest. And ultimately, it is military rule. So whether it was Britain, whether it was France, whether it was Spain, whether it was Holland, Dutch, all of these empires, were, whatever might have been the charade of democracy at home, now we can look back because the empires are gone. We are looking back and we are understanding the history. Whatever may be the, the talk about freedom and democracy and parliament was denied to the empire. Take the case of India, the crown jewel of the British Empire, the largest portion of humanity that was run by the British Empire. It was a conquest. And it was an imposition. It was a military rule. It was a charade. Britain ran the empire. Britain ran several hundred million people and their lives. Same thing with the French. Same thing with the Dutch. Same thing with the Belgium in Africa and the Spanish in Latin America and so on and so forth. So the benefits of the empire that is squeezing and plundering and pillaging the empire and brought home to the people of the empire, that is Britain and Holland and France, they benefited from that accumulated wealth that is brought home in whatever form. And the glory of the empire masks the reality of military power and freedom. This is what the founding fathers warned against. War and making a war and going to war is the instrument of all imperial powers, all fascist power, because it gives the most massive source of control over the people, coercion. You go to war abroad and you coerce the people at home. You become what George Bush came to define after 9-11. You are with us or against us. If, now, after Pearl Harbor, which American would be against taking out the Japanese? So immediately, the balloon of America first got punctured. Now we can see, looking back, that it was by design. It was by design what happened. And so, and out of that war, a war economy brought America out of depression. The depression that the America hadn't got out of until... Pearl Harbor. So the war economy, uh, control, um, and, and going beyond its own republic to run the affairs of the world became the new destiny of America. America always looked and talked about its manifest destiny, but manifest destiny was in the continent of North America, the American expansion across the Appalachian, across the Missouri into becoming a continental republic. But now the manifest destiny is to rule the, the world. It is in that context, the gravity of the Second World War as what had happened. The technology had developed and we had entered the nuclear age. And the devastation of that war was so immense that the idea that somehow an international organization, which the League had failed to do in Europe to the lead up of the 
war, Second World War in 1939, September 1939, must be brought about. And so the United Nations. And on the flip side of the argument is that the United Nations would be empowered to maintain a balance of power, great powers, to secure peace among the great powers. You know, so you open the United Nations Charter, right? that's the opening first article, the preamble. It is to prevent another war, the war that has happened, you know, coming out of it. And there was no reluctance, no opposition anymore within America to um, joining an international organization because America would be the leading power. Europe was flat on its back. And it has uh, a veto on the Security yeah. Council, too. That's right. So it would be, and 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 that power was then reflected in the two tiers of the United Nations, which was something that was an innovation, uh, which departed the United Nations from the League of Nations. That is, the United Nations had the two tiers: the Security Council, with five permanent members, you know, who were the allies during the war. So ironically, both Soviet Union and China were allies, and so they were they they were there. Why not India? Because India, if China is there, why not India? Well, India was still a, a colony of Britain. So you know, Britain was the allied leader power. So Britain is in the Security Council, and France by token, because France was the other leading uh, empire in Europe, uh, had been. And though France had been defeated by Hitler, uh, the Free French fought as an allied power. And so France was brought into the Security Council. So those, those five countries together, in a sense, would make the condominium. But principally, it would be the United States on the allied side. Soviet Union was still, you know, um, not in that same power position, uh, except for its military, uh, but it had been an allied power, and same with same with China. Here we might take note of it. You know, it was America was not only had emerged as the military power that had financed the Allies against Germany and Japan. The United States has emerged also as the technological power, the nuclear breakthrough. America was the only nuclear power country in 1945. Uh, so America was a leader in science, technology, uh, finance, and the America was an economic giant. More than 50% of the global GDP, excess of 50% of the global GDP was within America, one country with over 50% of the GDP, the global GDP. So all of that combined to make sure that this would be America's century in the sense that America would be at the helm of affairs and run it. So far, so good. But the downside, the worm in this arrangement is that America was slipping into becoming a full-fledged empire the American empire, which is completely antithetical to the notion of America as it was founded in 1776, a republican constitutional order, a democracy that is a republic of we the people. And, and that is what now, post-1945 to where we are, have arrived, is the, the thin edge of the wedge in the American system of government and American society starts widening over time. So from 1945 to 2015, when Donald Trump calls out America is a swamp or a rogue state, as you have, uh, have called out, and I agree with that, that America is now the world's biggest rogue state, the biggest swamp, the most dangerous enemy of individual rights, based freedom based upon individual rights, is America. How did this come about? Well, it came about because America became an empire in, in one simple term. And becoming an empire, America became a war-mongering state, a, 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 a country 
a power engage in perpetual war for quote unquote perpetual peace. It's I found it fascinating, Salim, that um, when I'm reading about all of these things of late, I try to identify when was the first inkling that things were being run not by our elected representatives, but by people behind the scenes, the puppet masters. And um, it was Prouty's book, Fletcher, J. Fletcher Prouty's book on JFK, which referenced in 1940, this is during the war, Britain was in the war at least, um, and it was a bombing of Rotterdam, and Winston Churchill was overheard saying that they're being driven by a high cabal, that there are forces that allowed this to happen or maybe orchestrated these things. And it's out of control of somebody like a Winston Churchill, a leader of Britain. And he's referring to somebody behind him, higher up, <laughs> a high cabal of people behind the scenes pulling everybody's strings. Now we call it the deep state, but um, it goes back a long time, 80 years at least, but perhaps even before then, I mean, if you go back to the founding of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, you know, it's just a handful of bankers started that. And of course, that destroyed the value of the dollar um, over time. So that's what interests me is like, yes, we talk about education. We talk about information journalism as being some of the pillars of the destruction of the United States. Money, Federal Reserve, another pillar. Right, but behind it all are people, maybe not so nefarious like a James Bond film, although some of them, like Klaus Schwab, certainly look like one of those, Blofeld. Um, but maybe not something like that, but a movement, a juggernaut of globalism that seems unstoppable because we can't put a finger on who's responsible. Your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, the the rise of what you are talking about, that uh, citing uh, Winston Churchill, the cabal, um, the cabal was present and has been present. Uh, ultimately, what is the cabal? That collection of individuals or people or interests that controls the lifeblood of an economy. The banking system, you know, uh, and therefore finances it, you know, and that cabal had risen in Europe and would become transported to America. America did not have a Federal Reserve until 1913. That was another amendment that was brought in, income tax, uh, Federal Reserve. And then, as I pointed out, um, the um, method of electing senators, uh, yeah. we change the whole relationship of checks and balances within the government, uh, within the republic. But coming back to the to the to the lifeblood of 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 a country of, of that is an economy, uh, who controls it or under whose direction it is managed and maintained becomes, you know, the most important issue or concern. And yet that um, does not get scrutinized or is brought to the notice of the people as it should, and then the people themselves wanting to know how this has happened. And it is not it is not discussed, and it it stands uh, hidden behind a curtain. And that's what you're referring to, what Churchill was talking about. So the city of London, the banking, and and that is a difference. It is a it is a huge story, and it is a story that that will take us a lot of time. I mean, how did you know, the city of London in terms of the banking center of both Europe, the empire, and later on the world come about, you know. Uh, and that story will take us into the revolution in Britain that, that is, you know, which was a continuation of the religious wars uh, in Europe uh, coming out of uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation played out in England with the Puritanical Revolution of the 17th century, the the uh, beheading of a pro-Catholic uh, king, Charles I, and so on and so forth, uh, Oliver Cromwell, and then 
the uh, edict that had been imposed by uh, Edward I uh, way back in 1290. Edward I was, if I, my memory serves me correctly, was the grandson of King John, who is famous for, or people make him famous for the Magna Carta. So his grandson, Edward I, Edward I in 1290's edict that expelled all the Jews from England, from the British Isle. And then 400 years later, that edict was revoked after Oliver Cromwell, or, or, or it was in the process of being revoked when Oliver Cromwell became the Lord Protector of England. And um, the, the uh, Jews were uh, allowed to come into from Holland into England. And among those Jews, then the return of the Jews that takes place into England uh, at the end of the uh, 17th century comes the banking houses, most importantly, that of the Ross, Rothschild, which establishes its center in the city of London. And that banking house and its affiliates uh, then move to United States, you know, and with the Federal Reserve, they come to control the American economy, you know, before the Federal Reserve. The banks were basically competing laissez-faire. That's what is capitalism in the open society. Laissez-faire, uh, non-monopoly, uh, and competition. And so the banks in America were um, basically under the control of people, that is, their shareholders within the laws of the state. Uh, of each ind independent state. So the wealth Fargo's and the wealth Fargo types of banks were basically state banks or city banks, municipality banks. Um, but with the Federal Reserve, with the income tax, with the change in the uh, Constitution with the 17th Amendment, it became more and more centralized. One of the things, again, since he raised the question, one of the things that we need to understand and keep in, in our mind, and especially now looking back, we are looking back, we're reaching more than a hundred years to explain the implosion of the American Republic that we are witnessing, uh, is that the Civil War itself was not simply about slavery. The storyline is it is slavery. But when the Civil War broke out, that is when uh, South Carolina fired the guns on Fort Sumter, uh, in April of 1861, soon after the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, um, and and the Confederacy states, the 11 Confederacy states that came together uh, and raised this flag challenging Washington, and the Union responded, and the war broke out. There was no issue of slavery on the table at that time. The issue of slavery came up when um, came up in the sense that Abraham Lincoln, in his 1863 proclamation, emancipated the slave. He becomes the president who emancipated the slave. But that was in the middle of the war. A lot of it had to do with state rights. And that the federal government, that is the Confederacy state that became eventually Confederacy state, saw that Washington was interfering in what is in the domain of the individual states and the constitution. So there were states north of the Mason-Dixie line that had become free states in the sense that they were not slave states. And 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 the states south of Mason-Dixie line uh, were slave states. They had two different cultures and, and, and there was difficulties and, and, and problems. Slavery looking back upon it now is something that is abominable you know nobody none of us nowhere around is going to argue and say that they are pro slave but the issue of slavery was embedded in the issue of state rights and so the decision that in a sense began the effect of raising this issue at the le to the level that it eventually became uh, an open declaration of war uh, when South Carolina fired those guns uh, was that the southern states wanted slaves with the property of the owners of the slaves. 
the farmers, the ranchers, and so on and so forth. It was a slave economy, plantation economy. Um, and the South wanted uh, that individual slaves that had fled uh, the slave states for freedom in the free states, that is not on the Mason-Dixie line, should be returned. And that was the issue that went to the Supreme Court because they were properties of the South, South you know, and, and, and the northern states were giving them, you know, um, what has become now the term with the illegal immigration, sanctuary. Sanctuary states, sanctuary towns, sanctuary municipality. Well, the idea of sanctuary was there before the Civil War. Then the northern state became the sanctuaries. Uh, they became the whole underground railway. And if the northern states couldn't give the sanctuary, then they moved to uh, Canada, to the Maritimes, to um, Quebec and to Ontario, the underground railway for the slaves. So um, the rights and the wrong of the slave issue, if you put it aside or you see it embedded in that constitutional dispute that becomes a civil war, it is about state rights. So now the issue of slavery is over by the time we are coming in that we are talking about, we are bracketing it, that is the Woodrow Wilson government. And the amendment, you can see with the rise, making of the Federal Reserve, with income tax, with the 17th Amendment, the federal powers is encroaching upon and undermining state powers to the extent that where we have now arrived, it is the fed federal power, it is Washington that basically runs the affair. A form of domestic imperialism, if you would, in a exactly, comparison. exactly, and that that is running parallel to. In fact, it is riding upon the transformation of America from a republic into an empire. And Fascinating. Would you would you say then, Salim? We've talked about a number of pillars bringing about the destruction and the downfall of the once great United States. Uh, one being journalism, information control, education, uh, money, um, the, the failure, um, the, the um, devolution from states' rights down to more of uh, electing your senators. But what else would you add? Well, well the primary thing I would add or, or emphasize, is already added, but I emphasize, is war. And what you see after 1945 is America is engaged in war right around the world. All, always. A forever All, war. Yeah, forever war. So that is that the precedent that tried to contain that and reverse that, it began with uh, Eisenhower who warned the American people and Eisenhower being not just any president, but Eisenhower being the president who was the supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II in Europe, the man who won the war, who understood from inside what the problems is or, or came to identify his parting farewell message in 1961 January was a warning to the Americans about the military-industrial complex. He actually, in his original draft of the speech, had written military-industrial-congressional complex. But then his advisors deleted the word congressional because he didn't want they didn't want him to take on the Congress and make again Republican Party an enemy of the uh, of, 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 of the what has become the swamp. But he warned. And the very next president was uh, John F. K. And John F. K. Uh, Kennedy, uh, after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, came to the conclusion that um, the military-industrial complex has not only to be contained, but it needs to be, you know, uh, brought down. And the two things that he uh, began with, which he never got the chance to complete, due to his assassination, was one, coming to uh, peace with um, a peaceful 
negotiated diplomatic settlement over the Cuban Missile Crisis instead of a war, which many of his generals were wanting. You know, I mean, Curtis LeMay is on record, uh, who was the uh, commander of the United States Strategic Air Force, to bomb uh, uh, Cuba. Um, and, and and they wanted that war, um, that, but but Kennedy um, engaged with Khrushchev both openly and through back channel to not only defuse it where the missiles were removed. Kennedy removed the missiles from Turkey that was pointed at uh, uh, Russia, and was the first president uh, in the nuclear age to come up with uh, uh, a treaty that was overwhelmingly voted in favor of at the Senate um, was the limitation treaty, the nuclear test ban treaty, the first step in the way forward uh, with uh, negotiation with the Soviet Union to start the process first of halting any further development of nuclear weapons and then to, you know, begin the process of uh, bringing it down. And so the test ban treaty was the first treaty. And the second one was that just before uh, he left for Dallas uh, in November 22nd, 1963, uh, that was the beginning of his um, campaign that would begin uh, in January of 1964 for his re-election, um, he signed the National Security uh, Memorandum, uh, Action Memorandum. Uh, I think the number was 263. Uh, he signed it to uh, begin the uh, pullback from Vietnam. Uh, that particular memorandum authorized the withdrawal of the first lot of American servicemen in South Vietnam. I think the number was something around a thousand. At that time in 1963, there were 15,000 or thereabouts servicemen um, in Vietnam uh, providing support to the South Vietnamese government against North Vietnam. And um, <clears throat> Uh, he that that uh, memorandum was would be the prelude because it was stated in the memorandum itself that by December uh, 1965, December 31, 1965, America would complete its withdrawal from Vietnam. In other words, he would be taking this memorandum into the campaign for 1964 election. And then uh, he would be bound and committed to a complete withdrawal from Vietnam in his second term, in the very first year of his inauguration in his second term, which would be in January 1965. And none of that happened. What happened was, in fact, the reversal of that memorandum immediately after his assassination by LBJ. And the rest is history on a fake pretext. The, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that the Vietnamese had fired upon an American uh, um, naval ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. The war began that went on for over a decade, you know, with 58,000 Americans dead, uh, but more importantly, more than 3 million Vietnamese dead, but not only Vietnamese, the, the casualty figures would be again and hundreds of thousands uh, in Laos, uh, in Cambodia, the whole disruption in that part of the world. For what end? Uh, ultimately, America had to withdraw or and, and did withdraw. So that that is again. I mean, the the book that that is. I think everybody should read is this war is a racket by one of the most highly decorated uh, military officer, General Smedley Darlington Butler, who died in 1940. He was a Marine Corps general, uh, and he spent all his life in warfare for the U.S. corporation, not for America, not for the Republic. That's the book about war is a racket, you see. Um, and, and that's the racket that America became after 1945, despite the warnings of uh, 
President Eisenhower and the effort of uh, John F. K. Uh, so from LBJ on, that one and the other one, which is in a sense a taboo subject, but let me put it down here, against the advice of all the senior members of the government, that is, uh, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, the National Council, uh, 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 Security Council. Uh, President uh, Truman went ahead in recognizing uh, the partition of Palestine and Israel. Uh, the advice was against it, and the advice was consistent with uh, the warning of President Washington that you do not get entangled with the affairs of the old world. This was the legacy of the British and the French Empire and, and World War I. You do not get involved and entangled with that. And you do not make any one country your favorite dependency or allied with. The American national interest is far wider than any particular one country. So this notion of special relationship that emerged in World War I, that America and Britain had special relationship. No such special relationship if people knew that Britain and America fought in the 1812-1814 war. That Britain, that America's uh, republic was founded based upon an insurrection. And if that insurrection had failed, all of the founding fathers would be hanging and be hanged by the British, you know. And, and that Britain supported the Confederacy states during the Civil War. It was Russia that supported uh, the Union. All of that was reversed in World War I and continued the special relationship and the special relationship that was founded in 1948 uh, um, with, uh, with Truman against the advice of, of his senior most cabinet members who had all served uh, under uh, President Wilts, uh, President Roosevelt. So that relationship, which was in, in effect a relationship that was created by money and by propaganda and by domestic factors, has become now the albatross that is hanging on America and in fact suffocating America where America has come today, you know, um, in, in terms of its uh, special relationship with Israel uh, and um, the American Congress as Patrick Buchanan, who had served President Nixon as a longtime Republican uh, and an America first person pointed out that there are two occupied territories in the world. One is the West Bank, and the other is the Congress. <laughs> occupied by whom? By the Israel lobby and the Israeli state. And that has come to haunt America uh, today, you know, and haunt the rest of the world and the perpetual warfare, you know, uh, that has gone on. So as, as, as we try to wrap this up, the end is the warfare, and the warfare is not simply against uh, a targeted enemy that is fabricated and created. Soviet Union was once an ally. Soviet Union then became an enemy during the Cold War. The Cold War ended. The Soviet Union got dismantled, and nevertheless, America started pushing NATO, whose function was now basically well past the expiry date. Yes. The NATO was created for the containment of Soviet Union on the European continent from advancing westward. Well, there was no more Soviet Union. And so the eastward expansion of NATO ultimately led to the Ukraine war. Uh, and two years later, these are the proxy wars. So you, these are pretexts that are created for America's military industrial complex to keep churning out its profit-making venture. Um, two years into this war, I counted right at the outset of the special military operation in February 2022 with you that this war is going to end in a disaster for the collective West. And it is precisely, it has ended in a disaster. You know, Ukraine has been destroyed. By whom? Not by Russia. 
but that is the common narrative in 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 the collective west in canada where canada saluting in the parliament 338 member parliament not a single voice in the parliament saying you know hang on halt pause who are we saluting we were saluting not only a ukrainian nazi president zelensky we were saluting a waffen waffen ss you know former soldier that fought against the Soviet Union when Soviet Union was our ally. The complete perversion of our political system. How did this come about? Well, it came about with the, 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 the leading country of the, of the West, that is the United States, rotting in its head, abandoning its Republican values, the values of freedom. And so you can line up all the attacks upon the people. It was not simply attack upon the enemy that was fabricated in the Ukraine war, Russia, in the wars in the Middle East, you know, on the pretext that Iraq and Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction when there was no weapons of mass destruction. That doesn't mean Saddam was a good guy. But what business did we have to go making war of over $2 trillion dollars and smashing the American economy. So you, you pile it up. We have been living a world of lies and there's nobody to call it out because America is no longer a republic. It's no longer a free society, an open society. America is now an oligarchy controlled again by a cabal. And so there is no media that is a free media, except the alternate media like us, uh, that is going to challenge the narrative of the oligarchs of the ruling class. So there is no longer what you and I and others and the world that looked up to America saw America as the open society, as a society where individual uh, where freedom as individual rights are fully protected. But all of that has gone off the rail. It's amazing that um, George Soros calls his globalist agenda the Open Society Foundations, um, you know, in, in total, in total um, flipping it about, because it's certainly not an open society that he's wishing for. It is a fascist society. Well, Selim, we started off the, the show by saying that we'll cover the past and then make some sort of uh, prognostication about 2024. But from our discussion, I would think that it's not going to be very hopeful, especially uh, when Biden was in, um, installed with Washington surrounded by 30,000, I think that was the number, troops. The whole area cordoned off with uh, were razor wire and fences. Nobody allowed to attend except the high cabal special friends. So, I mean, that that was the date that you said was, was the bracketing, right? The end of the United States, as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a nation, uh, as a republic, as a democracy, as anything. It is a dictatorship right now. So 2024, election year, Donald Trump um, riding high in the polls. Remember in 2016, he was riding really low in the polls and won. So now he's really high in the polls. Obviously, the people love him, and he would get elected if this was a fair uh, election. The question is not that Donald Trump will not win if there is a fair election. The question is whether we will have an election. Some people are suggesting that since all of the tactics of the Democrats and, and the Biden corrupt immoral regime are failing, all of the indictments are failing, all of the rhetoric by the yellow journalists are failing and the people love Donald Trump and he would get an elected in a landslide. Some, um, for example, Tucker Carlson are suggesting perhaps the only thing left for the deep state to do is what they did with John F. Kennedy and Dealey Plaza in Texas. What do you think? The deep state have been trying to assassinate John F. Uh, sorry, Donald Trump. And um, he has so far um, been successful in evading it. In other words, there are forces that are protecting him. I think in that sense, one can speculate that the American armed forces is split down the center, um, that there are those who are protective of Donald Trump, 
at the former president and uh, providing him that security. And then there are those who are with the installed president, President Biden, you know, people like Austin and others. Austin is a four-star general, secretary of defense. And 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 they are waging both domestically a war and, of course, waging a war abroad. So 2024 is a continuation of wars. I mean, we saw that, you know, it began with, with uh, the Ukraine war in 2022 when the midterm election happened and everybody was riled up and supporting that you know, 22 campaign. Um, the uni party was fully behind the war and so on. So 2024 is again another war uh, year with war, but this time the war has spread out of Ukraine into the Middle East, into into Gaza and Israel. Yeah. And the the Israelis, Bibi Netanyahu and company, are trying to widen that war by engaging with uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, and uh, Iran. The target is Iran, just as in 2003 after 9/11. The target became Iraq uh, to destroy Iraq. The target is now Iran. The question is: the world has changed between 2003 and 2024. In the two decades, a lot has changed. And what has changed fundamentally, if we move away from politics into the actual reality of where the world is, uh, the changes has been in the growing rupture or split between North and South, between the global North, which is again headed by America, uh, and the collective West, that is the European Union, NATO, uh, World Economic Forum, you know, all of these are part of that collective West and and uh, the collective West headed by America under the democratic power. That is why Trump had to be thrown out um, so that uh, the collective North, the collective West could go ahead with its fundamental effort to make the transition into one world government rule-based order. Um, and then the resistance to that, that was under the surface, fragmented, um, uh, and, and no cohesive center for that resistance to this program of uh, one uh, world government, uh, which is the World Economic Forum agenda, translated through the UN and uh, adopted by the Democrats in America, the Uni Party, basically, and in Canada and other G7 countries and European EU countries, the resistance has come together. And that resistance has come together as a result of the Ukraine war. The whole anticipation going into the Ukraine war that America launched the pretext uh, of pushing um, the, the expansion of NATO eastward, ultimately into uh, bringing Ukraine into NATO, and therefore Ukraine becoming a platform for NATO, especially for nuclear weapons, led to uh, the special military operation um, uh, by Moscow, by Putin, Two years later, that is in a shamble. But the calculation on the part of the neocons in America and the satellite countries of European Union, NATO, including Canada, was that the immense power of the collective North, collective West, would basically run over uh, Russia. Russia would just collapse, you know, uh, and and um, would eventually be dis dismantled because Russia was seen as the major opposition to the one world government program. And then if Russia is flattened, the next one would be China, you know, and 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 so with that there would be no opposition, no resistance. But lo and behold, what happened? Despite the massive sanction, despite throwing Russia out of the SWIFT banking system, and then the entire weight of the military-industrial complex of the Western powers of the collective North, the result has been just the opposite. Russia has basically hammered the collective North. This was a pure engagement. So how did the neocons in the Biden administration, but going all the way back to Obama and Clinton and Bush, 
father and son, how did they end up making such a massive miscalculation that they could believe that the American army, American military, uh, would flatten out Russia? Well, the miscalculation was their arrogance and hubris of the last 30 years of warfare, forgetting the warfare in Vietnam and, and then later on in Iraq, uh, sorry, Afghanistan, uh, the hubris that the American army that can smash up sandal-wearing people, whether it is in Iraq or whether it is in Yemen or whether it is in Libya or you know, so on and so forth, can meet a pure army that is Russia and smash it similarly that Russia is just another Iraq. Well, all of that has been punctured. America, in fact, is on its back, the collective north. And this has given a lot of strength to all those other countries that wouldn't have a center, wouldn't have a leadership that is the global south to come and rally together. That during this phase, the, the sanctions that were imposed on Russia, the global south refused to participate in it. Moreover, uh, what Nixon had achieved more than 50 years ago in driving a wedge between Russia and China, that is Soviet Union and China, and China had emerged in some sense as an ally and a dependency of the United States in the period after 1972, the neocons of the Biden administration ended up doing just the reverse, pushing China and Russia into the closest alliance. It is Russia and China alliance, is the U Eurasian alliance. And so when you explore this, what has happened, the rise of the BRICS nation, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the numbers are now increasing and joining, that would be, for those of us who have a sense of history of the 20th century in our mind uh, during the Cold War years, the Cold War split the world between East and West, but a whole chunk of the world was neither East nor West. They were the non-aligned countries. They were the former colonies of the European powers. India, for instance, was a leading country in there, uh, countries of Africa, some of the countries of Latin America. So the non-aligned countries had now become the BRICS nation. This is the global South. And there is a massive rupture taking place. And what I see in 2024, the direction that we are going is the 19th, uh, the 20th century East-West rupture or divide is now going to be replaced by the North-South divide. Uh, that is the global South along with Russia and China, both members of the Security Council, uh, opposed to rule-based order, opposed to the program of one world government of the WAF, opposed to the ending of the fossil fuel economy, that is the deindustrialization that the West has taken on for itself, as opposed to the woke agenda, as opposed to the big pharma. The global South is coming together. And economically, we can see that happening. So I just, if you give me another minute, uh, I will just run run it by you to show you how, um, how great is this rupture going to be. And countries like Canada have to decide whether they will go along being a satellite country of the United States or, whether, or, or for that matter, Germany or France, or whether they will break out and make peace with the global south. For instance, the top 10 countries in the world in terms of natural resources and their value. The number one country is Russia with a population of 144 million and natural resources in excess of $75 trillion. Number two country is United States, but the number three country is Saudi Arabia. Number four country is Canada, but the number fifth country is Iran, then China, then Brazil, then Iraq, then Venezuela. So the top 10 countries in terms of natural resource values, seven countries are from the global south. In terms of GDP ranking, the 
number one country of the top 10 is still the United States. But according to the PPP ranking, which is the purchasing power parity ranking, the top country is China. America is number two, but the number three country is India instead of Germany or Japan, you know. And again, in the top 10 countries, more than half the country, six countries, are from the global south, uh, based upon purchasing capacity. In 1945, as I said, uh, noted in a, a little while ago, that America, one country by itself, the United States, had in excess of 50% of the world's GDP. Today, in 2023, uh, uh, the year that ended, the American GDP share was 15%. China's GDP share globally was 18%. In a, that was, as some would argue, it was bound to happen. I mean, the position of America with 50% of the global share in 1945 was going to come down as other countries evolved and, and matured. But this change is not going to affect itself because of the politics of America and, and, and the global north. The politics of America is the politics of an empire. And the global south has rejected it. And what we are seeing with Clapton is these fabricated wars. We saw that war in Ukraine, you know, barely ending the wars of the Middle East in Afghanistan. I mean, Biden came to office in 1920, uh, 2021 or was installed in 2021. And immediately after was the Afghan debacle when, when the Biden administration left in a hurry from Kabul. But it didn't take the lesson. It pushed on to the Ukraine war. And then barely has the Ukraine war coming to an end. It is not yet over. Uh, you see the start of the war in the Middle East, you know. Uh, and this war has now lasted, uh, we are into the fourth month since the beginning of the Gaza war. No, None of the Middle East war with, within itself has lasted so long. It's four, and, and the question is whether it will be brought to an end by uh, the United Nations or it will continue the demands for bringing it to an end in the various resolution in the Security Council and in the General Assembly, the, the voting shows that the Global South overwhelmingly wants the war to come to an end. The only two countries that have been voting against it is the United States and Israel, and the collective West or the collective North have been abstaining. And the resolutions in the Security Council, again, the uh, United States has been vetoing it. Uh, uh, those resolutions. So what you see, when you put it all together, what I see is that if 2024, the main event in North America would be the election, and if the election was stolen, it is quite possible that the people would rebel, you know, uh, the, the Americans might rebel, and, and, and that raises the whole question that this open border migration that, that the Biden administration has allowed somewhere anywhere up to 10 billion people, you know, undocumented has come through the southern borders in Texas and Arizona and so on and so forth from the global south. Who are they? What is their interest? Why have they been brought in? Have they been brought in to be used against the American people? You know, arm them, give them citizenship, and then deploy them because that's been a discussion that is going on in the Senate. Uh, people have taken note of that. Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat from Illinois, has talked about giving uh, the young uh, men of military age and healthy in, in, in body and so on, uh, giving them rapid uh passage into citizenship, provided that they're willing to uh, join the army and 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 take on, wear the American uniform. So there you have it. You know, America is ready. I mean, if this all of this works out, America is now ready to, you know, uh, have uh, immigration and migration as a way, as a tool, an instrument of creating a mercenary army instead of a citizen's army. Because um, the Americans themselves, and particularly the Americans from the flyover country that had been the basic recruiting base of the American military, 
are no longer joining the American armed forces because of wokeism that has penetrated uh, the culture of the American military. And so here we have it. I mean, we, we, we began with the observation that one of the one of the features of this breakdown of America as a Republican society and a Republican order is the war against his own people. We can see that that is accelerating too. And the same thing is in Canada, same thing in Europe. I mean, in 2023, we saw the Dutch farmers coming out. 2024 began with the German farmers coming out in massive numbers. In 2022, it was the Yellow West in, in France that came out. None of them have disappeared. The AFD in Germany has become more and more prominent. You know, defending a German national interest in Canada, the same thing happened in 2022. The Freedom Convoy was uh, attacked. Uh, emergency power was used to dismantle it, just as in American in 2021, the J6 uh, uh, movement to protest against what was happening in American politics was attacked and called an insurrection, and people were arrested, and they are still being held in prison. Same thing in Canada. People arrested in the trucker convoy movement are being held uh, in prison. So the governments have turned a role in the West, and the governments have become, in a sense, a mirror image of what we used to see in the East with China, the Tiananmen Square massacre, if you all remember that in the transition, or uh, Soviet army moving into Czechoslovakia, or Hungary, or Poland. Well, here we have the American army or the American people in uniform, the law enforcement agencies, uh, striking against their own people in Canada, in, 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 in Europe. So this huge inversion that has taken place, where it is headed, I, I, what, I, what I see is the Eurocentric age is coming to an end, and with it, America's unipolar hegemony has basically broken down, and we are in the transition phase of a new rearrangement in which the global South will start playing a more and more uh, important role in world politics, uh, and we are in in that sense, uncharted water. You know, when I began, I, I mentioned how much I, I love the United States and the idea and the concept of it, but despise their current form and government. And it's one of the things I really despise about it, Salim, is that it has now made me root for the other guy. You know, I can't support the United States in, I don't know anything that it has done globally at all. And it's... Um, philosophy these days is antithetical to the philosophy of the founding fathers. So for that, I, I cannot forgive them. Anyway, it's a fascinating discussion. It could go on. There are so many things and so many facets to the decline and fall of the American Republic that we could go on forever talking about it. But I thank you for your input and your, uh, and your knowledge. Thanks, Celine. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much.